The Extraordinary Adventures of Arsène Lupin, Gentleman Burglar by Maurice Leblanc The Escape of Arsène Lupin Arsène Lupin has just finished his repast and taken from his pocket an excellent cigar with a gold band which he was examining with unusual care when the door of his cell was opened. He had barely time to throw the cigar into the drawer and move away from the table. The guard entered. It was the hour for exercise. I was waiting for you, my dear boy, exclaimed Lupin in his accustomed good humor. They went out together. As soon as they had disappeared at a turn in the corridor, two men entered the cell and commenced a minute examination of it. One was Inspector Dizzy, the other was Inspector Follenfon. They wished to verify their suspicion that Arsène Lupin was in communication with his accomplices outside of the prison. On the preceding evening, the Grand Journal had published these lines addressed to its court reporter. Monsieur, in a recent article you referred to me in most unjustifiable terms. Some days before the opening of my trial, I will call you to account. Arsène Lupin The handwriting was certainly that of Arsène Lupin. Consequently, he sent letters, and no doubt received letters. It was certain that he was preparing for that escape thus arrogantly announced by him. The situation had become intolerable. Acting in conjunction with the examining judge, the chief of the Surette, Monsieur Dudois, had visited the prison and instructed the jailer in regard to the precautions necessary to ensure Lupin's safety. At the same time, he sent the two men to examine the prisoner's cell. They raised every stone, ransacked the bed, did everything customary in such a case, but they discovered nothing and were about to abandon their investigation when the guard entered hastily and said, The drawer! Look in the table drawer! When I entered just now he was closing it. They opened the drawer and Yuzi exclaimed, Ah! We have him this time! Follenfant stopped him. Wait a moment, the chief will want to make an inventory. This is a very choice cigar. Leave it here and notify the chief. Two minutes later, Monsieur Dudois examined the contents of the drawer. First, he discovered a bundle of newspaper clippings relating to Arsène Lupin taken from the Argout de la Presse, then a tobacco box, a pipe, some paper called onion peel, and two books. He read the titles of the books. One was an English edition of Carlyle's Hero Worship, the other was a charming Elsevier in modern binding, the Manual of Epictetus, a German translation published at Leiden in 1634. On examining the books, he found that all the pages were underlined and annotated. Were they prepared as a code for correspondence, or did they simply express the studious character of the reader? Then he examined the tobacco box and the pipe. Finally, he took up the famous cigar with its gold band. Fichtre, he exclaimed, our friend smokes a good cigar, it's Henri Clay. With the mechanical action of an habitual smoker, he placed the cigar close to his ear and squeezed it to make it crack. Immediately, he uttered a cry of surprise. The cigar had yielded under the pressure of his fingers. He examined it more closely and quickly discovered something white between the leaves of tobacco. Delicately, with the aid of a pen, he withdrew a roll of very thin paper, scarcely larger than a toothpick. It was a letter. He unrolled it and found these words written in a feminine handwriting. The basket has taken the place of the others. Eight out of ten are ready. On pressing the outer foot, the plate goes downward. From 12 to 16 every day, H. Peel will wait. But where? Reply at once. Rest easy, your friend is watching over you. Monsieur Dudois reflected a moment and then said, It is quite clear 
the basket the eight compartments from 12 to 16 means from 12 to 4 o'clock but this HP that will wait HP must mean automobile HP horsepower is the way they indicate strength of the motor a 24 HP is an automobile of 24 horsepower then he rose and asked had the prisoner finished his breakfast yes and as he has not yet read the message which is proved by the condition of the cigar it is probable that he had just received it how in his food concealed in his bread or in a potato perhaps impossible his food was allowed to be brought in simply to trap him but we have never found anything in it we will look for lupin's reply this evening detain him outside for a few minutes I shall take this to the examining judge, and if he agrees with me, we will have the letter photographed at once. And in an hour, you can replace the letter in the drawer in a cigar similar to this. The prisoner must have no cause for suspicion. It was not without a certain curiosity that Monsieur Dudois returned to the prison in the evening, accompanied by Inspector Duesy. Three empty plates were sitting on the stove in the corner. He has eaten? Yes, replied the guard. Do please cut that macaroni into very small pieces and open that bread roll. Nothing? No, chief. Monsieur Dudois examined the plates, the fork, the spoon and the knife, an ordinary knife with a rounded blade. He turned the handle to the left, then to the right. It yielded and unscrewed. The knife was hollow and served as a hiding place for a sheet of paper. Phew, he said, that is not very clever for a man like Arsene, but we mustn't lose any time. You, Duzi, go and search the restaurant. Then he read the note. I trust to you, HP will follow at a distance every day. I will go ahead. Au revoir, dear friend. At last, cried Monsieur Dudois, rubbing his hands gleefully. I think we have the affair in our own hands. A little strategy on our part and the escape will be a success in so far as the arrest of his confederates are concerned. But if Arsène Lupin slips through your fingers, suggested the guard, we will have a sufficient number of men to prevent that. If, however, he displays too much cleverness, ma foi, so much the worse for him. As to his band of robbers, since the chief refuses to speak, the others must. And, as a matter of fact, Arsène Lupin had very little to say. For several months, Monsieur Jules Bouvier, the examining judge, had exerted himself in vain. The investigation had been reduced to a few uninteresting arguments between the judge and the advocate, Matre Danval, one of the leaders of the bar. From time to time, through courtesy, Arsène Lupin would speak. One day he said, Yes, Monsieur le Judge, I quite agree with you. The robbery of the Credit Lyonnais, the theft in the Rue de Babylone, the issue of the counterfeit banknotes, the burglaries at the various chateaux, Armesnil, Gouré, Imblevon, Grosselet, Malacquiz, all my work, Monsieur, I did it all. Then you will explain to me, it is useless. I confess everything in a lump, everything and even ten times more than you know nothing about. Wearied by his fruitless task, the judge had suspended his examinations, but he resumed them after the two intercepted messages were brought to his attention. And regularly, at midday, Arsène Lupin was taken from the prison to the depot in the prison van with a certain number of other prisoners. They returned about three or four o'clock. Now, one afternoon, this return trip was made under unusual conditions. The other prisoners not having been examined, it was decided to take back Arsène Lupin first, thus he found himself alone in the vehicle. These prison vans, vulgarly called panier à salade or salad baskets, are divided lengthwise by a central corridor, from which open ten compartments, five on either side. Each compartment is so arranged that the occupant must assume and retain a sitting posture, and consequently the five prisoners are seated one upon the other, 
and yet separated one from the other by partitions. A municipal guard standing at one end watches over the corridor. Arsene was placed in the third cell on the right, and the heavy vehicle started. He carefully calculated when they left the Quai de la Horloge and when they passed the Palais de Justice. Then, about the center of the Bridge Saint Michel, with his outer foot, that is to say his right foot, he pressed upon the metal plate that closed his cell. Immediately something clicked, and the metal plate moved. He was able to ascertain that he was located between the two wheels. He waited, keeping a sharp lookout. The vehicle was proceeding slowly along the boulevard Saint-Michel. At the corner of Saint-Germain it stopped. A truck horse had fallen. The traffic having been interrupted, a vast throng of fiacres and omnibuses had gathered there. Arsène Lupin looked out. Another prison van had stopped close to the one he occupied. He moved the plate still further, put his foot on one of the spokes of the wheel and leaped to the ground. A coachman saw him, roared with laughter, then tried to raise an outcry, but his voice was lost in the noise of the traffic that had commenced to move again. Moreover, Arsène Lupin was already far away. He had run for a few steps, but once upon the sidewalk he turned and looked around. He seemed to scent the wind like a person who is uncertain which direction to take. Then, having decided, he put his hands in his pocket, and with the careless air of an idle stroller, he proceeded up the boulevard. It was a warm, bright autumn day, and the cafes were full. He took a seat on the terrace of one of them. He ordered a bock and a package of cigarettes. He emptied his glass slowly, smoked one cigarette and lighted a second. Then he asked the waiter to send the proprietor to him. When the proprietor came, Arsene spoke to him in a voice loud enough to be heard by everyone. I regret to say, monsieur, I have forgotten my pocketbook. Perhaps, on the strength of my name, you will be pleased to give me credit for a few days. I am Arsène Lupin. The proprietor looked at him, thinking he was joking. But Arsène repeated, Lupin, prisoner at the centre, but now a fugitive. I venture to assume that the name inspires you with perfect confidence in me. And he walked away amidst shouts of laughter, whilst the proprietor stood amazed. Lupin strolled along the Rue Soufflot and turned into the Rue Saint-Jacques. He pursued his way slowly, smoking his cigarettes and looking into the shop windows. At the boulevard de Port Royal, he took his bearings, discovered where he was and then walked in the direction of the Rue de la Sainte. The high forbidding walls of the prison were now before him. He pulled his head forward to shade his face. Then, approaching the sentinel, he asked, Is this the prison de la Sainte? Yes. I wish to regain my cell. The van left me on the way and I would not abuse... Now, young man, move along, quick, growled the sentinel. Pardon me, but I must pass through the gate. And if you prevent Arsène Lupin from entering the prison, it will cost you dear, my friend. Arsène Lupin? What are you talking about? I'm sorry I haven't a card with me, said Arsène, fumbling in his pockets. The sentinel eyed him from head to foot in astonishment. Then, without a word, he rang a bell. The iron gate was partly opened and Arsène stepped inside. Almost immediately he encountered the keeper of the prison, gesticulating and feigning a violent anger. Arsène smiled and said, Come, monsieur, don't play that game with me. What? They take the precaution to carry me alone in the van? Prepare a nice little obstruction and imagine I am going to take to my heels and rejoin my friends. Well, and what about the twenty agents of the Sourette who accompanied us on foot, in fiacres and on bicycles? No, the arrangement did not please me. I should not have got away alive. Tell me, monsieur, did they count on that? He shrugged his shoulders and added, 
I beg of you, Monsieur, not to worry about me. When I wish to escape, I shall not require any assistance. On the second day thereafter, the Echo de France, which had apparently become the official reporter of the exploits of Arsène Lupin, it was said that he was one of its principal shareholders, published a most complete account of this attempted escape. The exact wording of the messages exchanged between the prisoner and the mysterious friend, the means by which correspondence was constructed, the complicity of the police, the promenade on the boulevard Saint-Michel, the incident at the Café Soufflot, everything was disclosed. It was known that the search of the restaurant and its waiters by Inspector Diouzi had been fruitless. And the public also learned an extraordinary thing which demonstrates the infinite variety of resources that Lupin possessed. The prison van in which he was being carried was prepared for the occasion and substituted by his accomplices for one of the six vans which did service at the prison. The next escape of Arsène Lupin was not doubted by anyone. He announced it himself in categorical terms in a reply to Monsieur Bovier on the day following his attempted escape. The judge, having made a jest about the affair, Arsène was annoyed, and firmly eyeing the judge, he said empathetically, Listen to me, monsieur. I give you my word of honor that this attempted flight was simply preliminary to my general plan of escape. I do not understand, said the judge. It is not necessary that you should understand. And when the judge, in the course of that examination, which was reported at the length in the columns of the Echo de France, when the judge sought to resume his investigation, Arsène Lupin exclaimed with an assumed air of lassitude, Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, what's the use? All these questions are of no importance. What? No importance? cried the judge. No, because I shall not be present at the trial. You will not be present? No, I have fully decided on that and nothing will change my mind. Such assurance combined with the inexplicable indiscretions that Arsène committed every day served to annoy and mystify the officers of the law. There were secrets known only to Arsène Lupin, secrets that he alone could divulge. But for what purpose did he reveal them and how? Arsène Lupin was changed to another cell. The judge closed his preliminary investigation. No further proceedings were taken in this case for a period of two months, during which time Arsène was seen almost constantly lying on his bed with his face turned towards the wall. The changing of his cell seemed to discourage him. He refused to see his advocate. He exchanged only a few necessary words with his keepers. During the fortnight preceding his trial, he resumed his vigorous life. He complained of want of air. Consequently, early every morning he was allowed to exercise in the courtyard, guarded by two men. Public curiosity had not died out. Every day it expected to be regaled with news of his escape. And, it is true, he had gained a considerable amount of public sympathy by reason of his verve, his gaiety, his diversity, his inventive genius and the mystery of his life. Arsène Lupin must escape. It was his inevitable fate. The public expected it and was surprised that the event had been delayed so long. Every morning the prefect of police asked his secretary, well, has he escaped yet? No, Monsieur le Prefect. Tomorrow, probably. And, on the day before the trial, a gentleman called at the office of the Grand Journal, asked to see the court reporter, threw his card in the reporter's face and walked rapidly away. These words were written on the card. Arsène Lupin always keeps his promises. It was under these conditions that the trial commenced. An enormous crowd gathered at the court. Everybody wished to see the famous Arsène Lupin. 
they had a gleeful anticipation that a prisoner would play some audacious pranks upon the judge. Advocates and magistrates, reporters and men of the world, actresses and society women were crowded together on the benches provided for the public. It was dark, somber day, with a steady downpour of rain. Only a dim light pervaded the courtroom, and the spectators caught a very indistinct view of the prisoner when the guards brought him in. But his heavy, shambling walk, the manner in which he dropped into his seat, and his passive, stupid appearance were not at all prepossessing. Several times his advocate, one of Monsieur Danval's assistants, spoke to him, but he simply shook his head and said nothing. The clerk read the indictment, then the judge spoke. Prisoner at the bar, stand up. Your name, age and occupation. Not receiving any reply, the judge repeated, Your name, I ask your name. A thick, slow voice muttered, Baudru, Desiré. A murmur of surprise pervaded the courtroom, but the judge proceeded, Baudru, Desiré, ah, a new alias. Well, as you have already assumed a dozen different names, and this one is no doubt as imaginary as the others, we will adhere to the name of Arsène Lupin, by which you are more generally known. The judge referred to his notes and continued. For, despite the most diligent search, your past history remains unknown. Your case is unique in the annals of crime. We know not whom you are, whence you came, your birth and breeding, all is a mystery to us. Three years ago you appear in our midst as Arsène Lupin, presenting to us a strange combination of intelligence and perversion, immorality and generosity. Our knowledge of your life prior to that date is vague and problematical. It may be that the man called Rostart, who eight years ago worked with Dixon, the prestigitator, was none other than Arsène Lupin. It is probable that the Russian student who six years ago attended the laboratory of Dr. Altier at the St. Louis Hospital and who often astonished the doctor by the ingenuity of his hypothesis on subjects of bacteriology and the boldness of his experiments in diseases of the skin was none other than Arsène Lupin. It is probable also that Arsène Lupin was the professor who introduced the Japanese art of Jiu-Jitsu to the Parisian public. We have some reason to believe that Arsène Lupin was the bicyclist who won the Grand Prix de l'Exposition, received his 10,000 francs and was never heard of again. Arsène Lupin may have been also the person who saved so many lives through the little dormer window at the charity bazaar and at the same time picked their pockets. The judge paused for a moment then continued. Such is that epoch which seems to have been utilized by you in a thorough preparation for the warfare you have since waged against society, a methodical apprenticeship in which you developed your strength, energy and skill to the highest point possible. Do you acknowledge the accuracy of these facts? During this discourse the prisoner had stood balancing himself, first on one foot, then on the other, with shoulders stooped and arms inert. Under the strongest light one could observe his extreme thinness, his hollow cheeks, his projecting cheekbones, his earthen colored face dotted with small red spots and framed in a rough straggling beard. Prison life had caused him to age and wither. He had lost the youthful face and elegant figure we had seen portrayed so often in the newspapers. It appeared as if he had not heard the question propounded by the judge. Twice it was repeated to him. Then he raised his eyes, seemed to reflect, then making a desperate effort he murmured, Baudru Désiré. The judge smiled as he said, 
I do not understand the theory of your defense, Arsène Lupin. If you are seeking to avoid responsibility for your crimes on the ground of imbecility, such a line of defense is open to you. But I shall proceed with the trial and pay no heed to your vagaries. He then narrated at length the various thefts, swindles and forgeries charged against Lupin. Sometimes he questioned the prisoner, but the latter simply grunted or remained silent. The examination of witnesses commenced. Some of the evidence given was immaterial. Other portions of it seemed more important, but through all of it there ran a vein of contradictions and inconsistencies. A wearisome obscurity enveloped the proceedings, until Detective Ganimard was called as a witness, then interest was revived. From the beginning the actions of the veteran detective appeared strange and unaccountable. He was nervous and ill at ease. Several times he looked at the prisoner with obvious doubt and anxiety. Then, with his hands resting on the rail in front of him, he recounted the events in which he had participated, including his pursuit of the prisoner across Europe and his arrival in America. He was listened to with great avidity, as his capture of Arsène Lupin was well known to everyone through the medium of the press. Toward the close of his testimony, after referring to his conversations with Arsène Lupin, he stopped twice, embarrassed and undecided. It was apparent that he was possessed of same thought which he feared to utter. The judge said to him sympathetically, If you are ill, you may retire for the present. No, no, but... He stopped, looked sharply at the prisoner and said, I ask permission to scrutinize the prisoner at closer range. There is some mystery about him that I must solve. He approached the accused man, examined him attentively for several minutes, then returned to the witness stand and in an almost solemn voice he said, I declare on oath that the prisoner now before me is not Arsène Lupin. A profound silence followed the statement. The judge, nonplussed for a moment, exclaimed, Ah, uh, what do you mean? That is absurd. The detective continued, At first sight there is a certain resemblance, but if you carefully consider the nose, the mouth, the hair, the color of skin, you will see that it is not Arsène Lupin. And the eyes, did he ever had those alcoholic eyes? Come, come, witness, what do you mean? Do you pretend to say that we are trying the wrong man? In my opinion, yes. Arsène Lupin has in some manner contrived to put this poor devil in his place, unless this man is a willing accomplice. This dramatic denouement caused much laughter and excitement amongst the spectators. The judge adjourned the trial and sent for Monsieur Bouvier, the jailer and guards employed in the prison. When the trial was resumed, Monsieur Bouvier and the jailer examined the accused and declared that there was only a very slight resemblance between the prisoner and Arsène Lupin. Well then, exclaimed the judge, who is this man? Where does he come from? What is he in prison for? Two of the prison guards were called and both of them declared that the prisoner was Arsène Lupin. The judge breathed once more. But one of the guards then said, Yes, yes, I think it is he. What? cried the judge impatiently. You think it is he? What do you mean by that? Well, I saw very little of the prisoner. He was placed in my charge in the evening and for two months he seldom stirred, but laid on his bed with his face to the wall. What about the time prior to those two months? Before that, he occupied a cell in another part of the prison. He was not in cell 24. Here, the head jailer interrupted and said, We changed him to another cell after his attempted escape. But you, monsieur, you have seen him during those two months. I had no occasion to see him. He was always quiet and orderly. 
And this prisoner is not Arsène Lupin? No. Then who is he? demanded the judge. I do not know. Then we have before us a man who was substituted for Arsène Lupin two months ago. How do you explain that? I cannot. In absolute despair, the judge turned to the accused and addressed him in a conciliatory tone. Prisoner, can you tell me now and since when you became an inmate of the prison de la Sante? The engaging manner of the judge was calculated to disarm the mistrust and awaken the understanding of the accused man. He tried to reply. Finally, under clever and gentle questioning, he succeeded in framing a few phrases from which the following story was gleaned. Two months ago, he had been taken to the depot, examined and released. As he was leaving the building, a free man, he was seized by two guards and placed into the prison van. Since then, he had occupied cell 24. He was contented there, plenty to eat and he slept well so he did not complain. All that seemed probable, and amidst the mirth and excitement of the spectators, the judge adjourned the trial until the story could be investigated and verified. The following facts were at once established by an examination of the prison records. Eight weeks before a man named Baudreau Desiré had slept at the depot, he was released the next day and left the depot at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. On the same day at 2 o'clock, having been examined for the last time, Arsène Lupin left the depot in a prison van. Had the guards made a mistake? Had they been deceived by the resemblance and carelessly substituted this man for their prisoner? Another question suggested itself. Had the substitution been arranged in advance? In that event, Baudru must have been an accomplice and must have caused his own arrest for the express purpose of taking Lupin's place. But then, by what miracle had such a plan, based on a series of improbable chances, been carried to success? Baudru Desiree was turned over to the anthropological service they had never seen anything like him. However, they easily traced his past history. He was known at Courbevoie, at Asnieré and at Levallois. He lived on alms and slept in one of those rag pickers' huts near the Barrière de Terné. He had disappeared from there a year ago. Had he been noticed away by Arsène Lupin? There was no evidence to that effect. And even if that was so, it did not explain the flight of the prisoner. That still remained a mystery. Amongst twenty theories which sought to explain it, not one was satisfactory. Of the escape itself, there was no doubt. An escape that was incomprehensible, sensational, in which the public, as well as the officers of the law, could detect a carefully prepared plan a combination of circumstances marvelously dovetailed, whereof the denouement fully justified the confident prediction of Arsène Lupin, I shall not be present at my trial. After a month of patient investigation, the problem remained unsolved. The poor devil of a Badru could not be kept in prison indefinitely, and to place him on trial would be ridiculous. There was no charge against him. Consequently, he was released, but the chief of the Surette resolved to keep him under surveillance. This idea originated with Ganimard. From his point of view, there was neither complicity nor chance. Baudru was an instrument upon which Arsène Lupin had played with his extraordinary skill. Baudru when set at liberty, would lead them to Arsène Lupin, or, at least, to some of his accomplices. The two inspectors, Folenfon and Duesi, were assigned to assist Ganimard. One foggy morning in January, the prison gates opened and Baudru Desiree stepped forth, a free man. At first, he appeared to be quite embarrassed, 
and walked like a person who has no precise idea whither he is going. He followed the Rue de la Sainte and the Rue Saint-Jacques. He stopped in front of an old clothes shop, removed his jacket and his vest, sold his vest on which he realized a few sous. Then, replacing his jacket, he proceeded on his way. He crossed the Seine. At the Châtelet, an omnibus passed him. He wished to enter it, but there was no place. The controller advised him to secure a number, so he entered the waiting room. Ganimard called to his two assistants, and without removing his eyes from the waiting room, he said to them, Stop a carriage, no, two. That will be better. I will go with one of you and we will follow him. The men obeyed, yet Baudru did not appear. Ganimard entered the waiting room. It was empty. Idiot that I am, he muttered. I forgot there was another exit. There was an interior corridor extending from the waiting room to the Rue Saint-Martin. Canimard rushed through it and arrived just in time to observe Baudru upon the top of the Batignol Jardin de Platz omnibus as it was turning the corner on the Rue de Rivoli. He ran and caught the omnibus, but he had lost his two assistants. He must continue the pursuit alone. In his anger, he was inclined to seize the man by the collar without ceremony. Was it not with premeditation and by means of an ingenious ruse that this pretended imbecile had separated him from his assistants? He looked at Baudru. The latter was asleep on the bench, his head rolling from side to side, his mouth half opened and an incredible expression of stupidity on his blotched face. No, such an adversary was incapable of deceiving old Ganimard. It was a stroke of luck, nothing more. At the Galerie Lafayette, the man leaped from the omnibus and took the La Muette tramway, following the Boulevard Haussmann and the Avenue Victor Hugo. Baudru alighted at La Muette station and, with a nonchalant air, strolled into the Boy de Boulogne. He wandered through one path after another and sometimes retraced his steps. What was he seeking? Had he any definite object? At the end of an hour, he appeared to be faint from fatigue, and, noticing a bench, he sat down. The spot, not far from Orteil, on the edge of a pond hidden amongst the trees, was absolutely deserted. After the lapse of another half hour, Canimard became impatient and resolved to speak to the man. He approached and took a seat beside Baudru, lighted a cigarette, traced some figures in the sand with the end of his cane and said, It's a pleasant day. No response. But suddenly the man burst into laughter, a happy, mirthful laugh, spontaneous and irresistible. Canimard felt his hair stand on end in horror and surprise. It was that laugh, that infernal laugh he knew so well. With a sudden movement, he seized the man by the collar and looked at him with a keen, penetrating gaze, and found that he no longer saw the man Baudru. To be sure, he saw Baudru, but at the same time he saw the other, the real man, Lupin. He discovered the intense life in his eyes, he filled up the shrunken features, he perceived the real flesh beneath the flabby skin, the real mouth through the grimaces that deformed it. Those were the eyes and mouth of the other, and especially his keen, alert, mocking expression, so clear and youthful. Arsène Lupin, Arsène Lupin, he stammered. Then, in a sudden fit of rage, he seized Lupin by the throat and tried to hold him down. In spite of his fifty years, he still possessed unusual strength, while his adversary was apparently in a weak condition. But the struggle was a brief one. Arsène Lupin made only a slight movement, and, as suddenly as he had made the attack, Ganimard released his hold. His right arm fell inert, useless. If you had taken lessons in Jiu-Jitsu at the Quai des Orfevres, said Lupin, 
you would know that that blow is called Udishigi in Japanese. A second more and I would have broken your arm, and that would have been just what you deserve. I am surprised that you, an old friend whom I respect and before whom I voluntarily expose my incognito, should abuse my confidence in that violent manner. It is unworthy. Ah, what's the matter? Ganimard did not reply. That escape for which he deemed himself responsible, was it not he, Ganimard, who by his sensational evidence had led the court into serious error? That escape appeared to him like a dark cloud on his professional career. A tear rolled down his cheek to his grey moustache. Oh, mon dieu, Ganimard, don't take it to heart. If you had not spoken, I would have arranged for someone else to do it. I couldn't allow poor Baudru Desiree to be convicted. Then, murmured Ganimard, it was you that was there, and now you are here. It is I, always I, only I. Can it be possible? Oh, it is not the work of a sorcerer. Simply, as the judge remarked at the trial, the apprenticeship of a dozen years that equips a man to cope successfully with all the obstacles in life. But your face, your eyes. You can understand that if I worked 18 months with Dr. Altier at the St. Louis Hospital, it was not out of love for the work. I consider that he, who would one day have the honor of calling himself Arsène Lupin, ought to be exempt from the ordinary laws governing appearance and identity. Appearance? That can be modified at will. For instance, a hypodermic injection of paraffin will puff up the skin at the desired spot. Pyrogallic acid will change your skin to that of an Indian. The juice of the greater Celandine will adorn you with the most beautiful eruptions and tumors. Another chemical affects the growth of your beard and hair. Another changes the tone of your voice. Add to that two months of dieting in cell 24, exercises repeated a thousand times to enable me to hold my features in a certain grimace to carry my head at a certain inclination and adapt my back and shoulders to a stooping posture. Then five drops of atropine in the eyes to make them haggard and wild and the trick is done. I do not understand how you deceive the guards. The change was progressive. The evolution was so gradual that they failed to notice it. But Baudru Desiree? Baudru exists. He is poor, harmless fellow whom I met last year, and really he bears a certain resemblance to me. Considering my arrest as a possible event, I took charge of Baudru and studied the points wherein he we differed in appearance with a view to correct them in my own person. My friends caused him to remain at the depot overnight, and to leave there next day about the same hour as I did, a coincidence easily arranged. Of course, it was necessary to have a record of his detention at the depot in order to establish the fact that such a person was a reality. Otherwise, the police would have sought elsewhere to find out my identity. But, in offering to them this excellent Baudru, it was inevitable, you understand, inevitable that they would seize upon him. And, despite the insurmountable difficulties of a substitution, they would prefer to believe in a substitution than confess their ignorance. Yes, yes, of course, said Ganimard. And then, exclaimed Arsène Lupin, I held in my hands a trump card, an anxious public watching and waiting for my escape. And that is the fatal error into which you fell, you and the others, in the course of that fascinating game pending between me and the officers of the law, wherein the stake was my liberty. And you supposed that I was playing to the gallery, that I was intoxicated with my success. I, Arsène Lupin, guilty of such weakness. Oh no, and no longer ago than the Cahern affair you said, when Arsène Lupin cries from the housetops that he will escape, he has some object in view. But, Sapristi, you must understand that in order to escape I must create, in advance, a public belief in that escape. 
a belief amounting to an article of fate, an absolute conviction, a reality as glittering as the sun. And I did create that belief that Arsène Lupin would escape, that Arsène Lupin would not be present at his trial. And when you gave your evidence and said, that man is not Arsène Lupin, everybody was prepared to believe you. Had one person doubted it, had anyone uttered this simple restriction, suppose it is not Arsène Lupin, from that moment I was lost. If anyone had scrutinized my face, not imbued with the idea that I was not Arsène Lupin, as you and the others did at my trial, but with the idea that I might be Arsène Lupin, then, despite all my precautions, I should have been recognized. But I had no fear. Logically, psychologically, no one could entertain the idea that I was Arsène Lupin. He grasped Ganimard's hand. Come, Ganimard, confess that you, on the Wednesday after our conversation in the prison de la Sainte, you expected me at your house at four o'clock, exactly as I said I would go. And your prison van? said Ganimard, evading the question. A bluff. Some of my friends secured that old unused van and wished to make the attempt. But I considered it impractical without the concurrence of a number of unusual circumstances. However, I found it useful to carry out that attempted escape and give it the widest publicity. An audaciously planned escape, though not completed, gave to the succeeding one the character of reality simply by anticipation. So that cigar, hollowed by myself as well as the knife, and the letters, written by me, and the mysterious correspondent, did not exist. Ganimard reflected a moment, then said, when the anthropological service had Baudru's case under consideration, why did they not perceive that his measurements coincided with those of Arsène Lupin? My measurements are not in existence. Indeed, at least they are false. I have given considerable attention to that question. In the first place, the Bertillon system of records, the visible marks of identification, and you have seen that they are not infallible, and after that, the measurements of the head, the fingers, the ears, etc. Of course, such measurements are more or less infallible. Absolutely. No, but it costs money to get around them. Before we left America, one of the employees of the service there accepted so much money to insert false figures in my measurements. Consequently, Baudru's measurements should not agree with those of Arsène Lupin. After a short silence, Canimard asked, What are you going to do now? Now, replied Lupin, I am going to take a rest, enjoy the best of food and drink, and gradually recover my former healthy condition. It is all very well to become Baudru or some other person on occasion and to change your personality as you do your shirt, but you soon grow weary of the change. I feel exactly as I imagine the man who lost his shadow must have felt, and I shall be glad to be Arsène Lupin once more." He walked to and fro for a few minutes, then stopping in front of Ganimard, he said, You have nothing more to say, I suppose? Yes. I should like to know if you intend to reveal the true state of facts connected with your escape. The mistake that I made, oh, no one will ever know that it was Arsène Lupin who was discharged. It is to my own interest to surround myself with mystery, and therefore I shall permit my escape to retain its almost miraculous character. So have no fear on that score, my dear friend, I shall say nothing. And now, goodbye. I am going out to dinner this evening and have only sufficient time to dress. I thought you wanted to rest. Ah, there are duties to society that one cannot avoid. Tomorrow I shall rest. Where do you dine tonight? With the British ambassador.